um, uh, and students um, uh, for their presence here. Um, this, um, as uh, Professor Mark Steve has said in his very generous introduction, um, draws from two of the strands uh, in my work uh, and my career. Uh, one is the return of the Buddha, uh, Ancient Symbols for a New Nation, uh, where I looked at uh, the development of uh, archaeology of Buddhism, uh, both in Europe and in India, um, particularly in the 19th and 20th centuries, um, and the way in which this impacted thinking of the study of the past in India. So that's one strand that, that will come through um, in this lecture, and particularly in the first half. Um, the second strand and my second um, axis of this lecture is uh, my work um, at the National Monuments Authority. Uh, this was uh, work which I, where I was employed by the Ministry of Culture, Government of India, um, for the last three years, um, 2012 to 2015. Um, and also as part of this, um, as part of, of this job, um, had or was able uh, to present uh, a new project, Project Mossum, to the UNESCO World Heritage Committee in 2014. So essentially, there are two, there are two strands which will run through this lecture. Um, the relationship of the past and the present, and I'm arguing it's a dynamic relationship. And the second point that um, I um, more recently have been very convinced by um, is that heritage, particularly world heritage, um, as of now, this is something which only the bureaucrats and the government deal with. So the, the government, the, any state government, in our case the government of India, decides what is to be nominated for World Heritage position. Um, the focus is more on conservation rather than trying to understand the site. And where I'm arguing is that um, this is not a very happy position. Um, as of now, academics, and I, I speak um, uh, with some responsibility, having taught at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, um, academics have not been concerned, not been involved with looking at heritage. This is something that the Archaeological Survey of India does, which is a government body. Um, and so the point that I would like to argue and the point that I would like to stress here is that um, uh, it is about time that academics, historians, students, researchers um, intervene and um, um, look at heritage from an academic uh, perspective. Uh, there's a resolution on cultural diversity. 
uh, and I can go on and on. This is just very, just a, a sort of sample um, to, to explain to you that um, UNESCO and the way in which it looks at heritage has moved uh, way beyond the 1972 convention, has brought in cultural diversity, plurality, outreach programs, um, uh, drawing together the public, drawing together the communities that live around monuments or that live around heritage sites. Um, unfortunately, that has not translated into, uh, into uh, national agendas. Uh, one of the prime problems is that in India, uh, there's a multipl multiplicity of local agencies which handle these the conventions. So for example, 1972 convention is handled by the Archaeological Survey of India. 1995, which is part of uh, the World Register to, pro to protect the documentary heritage, is handled by the National Archives. Uh, there's uh, uh, the intangible heritage, which again creates a certain dichotomy between tangible and intangible, uh, is handled by Sahitya Academy. So the point then is that if one looks at what is happening at the global level, and what is happening at the national level, uh, there is uh, a disconnect. There is a multiplicity of agencies. Now you can argue that that is fine, but you know these are agencies which have been set up by the government of India. And where do we come in? And where does uh, you know why bring us in into this dialogue? And my point there is that if academics, if researchers, if historians looked at monuments differently, studied monuments differently, then. Uh, this would uh, this would be reflected in secondary writings, in the way in which we look at world heritage sites, and really, really people have to pay attention. So uh, that is my starting point. If we look at world heritage sites in India, the whole world has more than a thousand, a thousand and seven world heritage sites. India has only thirty-two, and like I said, these are divided into twenty-five cultural and seven natural. Uh, based on uh, the 1972 division. Uh, there are, uh, today, UNESCO World Heritage Conventions have become very strict, so one has to put uh, sites on the tentative list before they can be put up for nomination. So Nalanda um, has, is actually called Excavated Remains at Nalanda. That is the listing. And I think that's important to bear in mind. Uh, this has been put on the tentative list in 2009. There's a lot of discussion about um, getting this inscribed as a world heritage site. What does this mean and how does, um, what should we do about it? Um, there are also transnational projects where I mentioned Project Mosul, which really talks about maritime connections, but this China Silk Roads project, uh, which looks at uh, routes, at cultural routes, and so on. Um, I will not talk about transnational projects here uh, uh, because I think the major focus will be on the excavated remains at Nalanda. The latest site to be uh, inscribed on the World Heritage List is the Stepwell uh, in uh, Gujarat, and again, this is inscribed as a monument. Um, and there are other issues involved there, but let's not talk about that. So what then is the big advantage of having a World Heritage Site and what, you know, where does this get us? As of now, um, the major focus is on conservation, not on study and research. So when UNESCO comes and looks at these sites, they are, they are basically looking at how do we conserve this site and if the conservation has been done adequately or there are, um, there are needs there. So um, there is then a need to balance uh, the global. The global has moved on, has moved uh, far beyond the national, um, and issues of local and um, national, not just conservation and management, but the whole way in which monuments relate to uh, people who live around them. Um, as of now, the major advantage, and uh, I would be very happy if uh, people respond and give me other, um, other solutions, um, the major uh, uh, advantage of promoting heritage is tourism. So it's often argued that if it's on the World Heritage List, more tourists will come, more tourists will, uh, it will be better for the economy, there will be more hotels, uh, more shops, more souvenirs. Um, and I'm really wondering whether uh, is that all, and that's where we should stop. Uh, so the, my concerns then are that what does not happen, 
uh, with World Heritage nomination is interdisciplinary research, um, capacity building, and really critical thinking on monuments. Uh, so I do argue that uh, archaeology and history, uh, apart from conservation, really have no part in World Heritage nominations. Um, and that's a very sad state of affairs. And that's something which needs to be certainly rectified. So what then are the issues that I'm uh, going to discuss today? The first point um, is, uh, what do we make of monuments and archaeological sites? Um, and for me, these are important um, uh, media for storage and recycling of historical memory, which means that a monument, which we look at today only as uh, um, something which comes up at a particular point in time, so Nalanda came up in 5th century AD, end of story, full stop. But Nalanda, from 5th century or whatever century it started, till today, has gone through a whole range of historical uh, time. It, uh, it inscribes memories of this historical time. Now, how do we go about uh, un, uh, learning from these multiple layers? How do we go, go about trying to put Nalanda back in a holistic perspective rather than the way we look at it today, uh, when, it is, when it came into being, and which was the ruler which gave patronage. Um, so the point then is, that um, in any study of monuments, um, I would argue that um, uh, this needs to be taken up in a very different way from what has been done. Um, and um, uh, we need to really look not just at um, uh, the archaeological survey and the legislation, um, but we need to look at a broader landscape, what I call the cultural uh, landscape. Um, you know about this, this is on the website uh, where the archaeological survey, um, uh, the, their bid for, for um, tentative status for Nalanda, the excavated remains at Nalanda, um, they are there and you can have a look at this. What I've done is I've taken out the main points of uh, what they say, why should Nalanda be nominated, what is special about Nalanda, um, and um, uh, uh, why are they promoting it. First point is name, so there is a seal which has been found, which says Sri Nalanda Mahavihar Viharia Arya Bhikshu Sangvasya. So we know that its ancient name was Nalanda Mahavihar. Uh, this, is, uh, this is not, I have not made this up. This is from the website and this is from the ASI's um, statements. Uh, 6th, 5th century BCE, the Buddha is supposed to have visited the site. It is supposed to be the face of birth and nirvana of the Buddha's disciples, particularly Sariputra. Second century CE, 108 temples are said to have been built um, to prevent the decline of Hinayana and Mahayana schools of Buddhism. And fifth century, of course, the University of Nalanda um, became a great institution. And this is the reason why ASI argues that uh, the, uh, uh, the Nalanda Mahavihara needs to be inscribed as a World Heritage Site. Now if we go back, where is ASI drawing these conclusions from? Uh, obviously they haven't made it up, and these conclusions are coming from somewhere. Um, I would argue that these conclusions are coming from this 1861, that's the map of uh, that Alexander Cunningham, he prepared and published in 1861, so we're really looking at mid-19th century. Um, and the same conclusions that ASI is promoting, the conclusions come from Alexander Cunningham's work, which was not excavation, which was a survey work of Nalanda. Um, having said that, I think there are two important, uh, two important uh, points raised by Cunningham, uh, which have been um, neglected by the archaeological survey. The first point that he, that he raises is uh, that the mounds around Nalanda, they possess finer and more numerous examples of sculptures than any other place that I have visited. So clearly there's something special about Nalanda. Uh, just the sheer wealth of sculptures that we have from the site. Uh, this does not figure into any discussion and this does not figure into the A size, nor do they explain why is it. So is Nalanda special? If it is special, in what way is it special? The second thing that does not come up in, uh, in our discussion and also in uh, the way we write about Nalanda 
is um, Cunningham mentions these tanks. And remember, again, it's 1861, they're all marked with those red arrows on the screen. And he says that I cannot close this account of ancient Nalanda without mentioning the, the noble tanks which surround the ruins on all sides. What are these tanks doing? Were they just there for decoration? And uh, what is the relationship between the monastery and the tanks? And why are they, their tanks um, um, all around the site? So the two examples, the uniqueness of Nalanda and the exuberance of sculptures, why so many sculptures have been found in Nalanda, and why should there be all these tanks, these two issues remain unresolved. I will then move on, and I'm not trying, I'm now not going to, uh, I don't have the time to summarize Friedrich Asher's book, I know he was here, I know he's spoken, he's brought out a book um, uh, which has been published by Mar 2015 on uh, situating the great monastery at Nalanda. Uh, when you look at Andre Wick's a review of it, and this uh, appeared very recently in the Indian Express, something which is very striking is the last line. He says that, uh, one, he says history of Buddhism in India is shrouded in obscurity, and he's really reflecting on Asher's Mar volume. And uh, Andre Wick is a medieval historian who's written on maritime trade. Uh, so he argues that we don't know anything about, or it's still obscure. I'm not sure many people would agree in, in this audience with that. Uh, uh, and the second point he says is that Nalanda, the excavated remains at Nalanda are a modern reconstruction. So now we have these two extremes. There is ASI, which repeats 1861 Alexander Cunningham. We have Andre Wing, based on Friedrich Asher's um, 2015 book, who says it's a modern reconstruction. So where do we um, go from here? How do we assess ASI's bit? The first point that I would like to make, and I think I would like to make this very strongly, is that if you look at Nalanda, and if you look at its present limits, this is an artificial demarcation of space. Uh, the land around Nalanda, before excavation started, was bought in 1916, and was bought with the money available with the ASI, if they had more money, or if there was you know, not people living around, or you know, if there were no villages, they would have maybe bought more. So the first point that we need to bear in mind is today's Nalanda is an artificially uh, demarcated space. Um, the second point that I would like to make is there's a large corpus of sculptures, seals, bronzes, manuscripts, uh, which reflect the dynamism of Nalanda as a lived site. So what we are looking at is not when Nalanda was made, not just the architectural ruins, which is the focus of the bid as of now, but there's a whole lot of other things that were happening. And if we really look at the sculptures, bronzes, so on, we can get an idea of what was happening. Um, third point is that uh, Nalanda was not by itself, you know, somewhere back up beyond uh, a, a Bihar living in splendid isolation. It was linked to many other sites. What was this interaction? Which are the sites? What does this tell us? Um, so the point then is, uh, what makes Nalanda special? And what is the relationship of the excavated site with the tanks? And what does this indicate about traditional water management, but much more importantly, um, Buddhism as a social religion? So what was the social base of Buddhism? Uh, this gives you an idea of, you can see those white lines, the present limits of the excavated uh, site at Nalanda. Um, the arrow points this out. This is uh, the line as it exists today. Uh, you still see uh, those red arrows uh, showing the tanks. Um, and uh, um, uh, so we have not, we have the site in between, but the cultural landscape is much larger and uh, much wider than what is being, what we see today and what is being promoted today. Let me move on to, some, to another quote. This time it's uh, from a professor in international business and trade at Yale School of Management. And this quote came up in 2006 when the present Nalanda University was being planned. Um, and what I thought was quite interesting and you know, which talks to my own work is the point that he makes that the West rediscovered its relationship, its roots with Greece and Rome, and it benefited from that. 
Um, and it argues that Asia should perhaps do the same. Uh, and Nalanda could then become this springboard of uh, relating the past with the present. And I would argue that World Heritage nomination provides us this space to negotiate the past. And we have the legislation, which is UNESCO legislation. The point is we need not stick to the way in which 1972 is structured, but we need to move beyond and, um, and really work on extending uh, the scope of this nomination. Uh, let me also bring in, in, while I'm talking about this relationship of the past and the present, uh, I'm not sure how many people know um, about the fact that the Constitution of India has paintings um, in, uh, in the hand of the, the, the calligraph, the copy that was written by hand. These paintings, there are about 22 paintings, which were done by Nandlal Bose. Um, what is interesting and what I found really startling is that these paintings relate to archaeology and history. Uh, the Constitution is, after all, a political document. Why should it have paintings um, from history and archaeology? And what does this tell us about our founding fathers and the way in which uh, they thought the past should relate to the present at the time when India was uh, just becoming independent? Uh, now, the paintings start from the Harappan period. I will show you the examples in a moment. Um, and they stretch uh, all the way to modern uh, leaders and thinkers, Gandhi, Bose, and so on. Uh, the ancient monastery of Nalanda is on page 105, and it shows both the, uh, uh, both the seal and also Nandalal Bose's uh, uh, painting of what he thought Nalanda was. Uh, and of course, there are several others, not surprisingly, uh, the boat from Mahanjadaro, Borobudur, and so on. Um, as you all know, um, the national emblem of India uses the Sarnath Nayan capital, which was <coughs> found in excavations uh, in the early 20th century. So it was not a given, it was found. Um, uh, and um, this is associated with Ashok, and Ashok plays a prominent role in these paintings. Uh, the bottom is Bose's painting on Ashok spreading the Dhamma. Uh, page 105 on uh, the um, scheduled and tribal areas, um, you get the painting of the Nalanda seal on top. Um, and the, uh, at the bottom, uh, which is the next slide, uh, is the painting of the Nalanda Mahavihar. Now, what is interesting is that the seal was found in the archaeological excavations um, starting in 1916. Um, and were used, and the sea was used by Nandal Bose to uh, make this, uh, his painting at the top of the chapter. Um, and uh, uh, this seal uh, on top shows uh, the two deer and uh, with the Dharma Chakra in between. The Dharma Chakra is there. Um, what is interesting is that the same seal also occurs on the copper plates of the Pala period. And sometimes uh, the names of kings are also given. So uh, the seal, I would argue, is, um, provides a much larger context than only um, the, um, the Mahavihar of Nalanda. Uh, that is a painting of uh, monks at the Mahavihar. I would argue that uh, the left shows the Chinese monks. I'm, this is my <laughs> speculation, but you know, um, that's open to uh, question. But certainly what is, it, what is interesting is that all these paintings should be there. Sorry. Um, so the point then is that um, why, what are these paintings doing in a political document and why were they included? Um, and as you know, the Constituent Assembly debates are all now online, but also in several volumes. And if you actually go through them, it's interesting that this was debated and discussed over uh, several meetings. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details. I'd just like to quote one parliamentarian, uh, say Govindas, um, who says that uh, the, uh, the makers of the Constitution are aware that 
they could not transform the India of today into the India of Rigvedic times. So certainly there's, there's a lot of time which has gone on between the past and the present. But at the same time, they argue that when one is looking at uh, early history, at the future, uh, one, cannot one cannot reject the past. And hence, it is to restore this balance between the past and the present that the paintings um, uh, should be included. And the paintings were included and draw on history and archaeology. Uh, the second point which comes out from if you look at the paintings and if you look at the history of archaeology in India is that Nandalal Bose was very aware of the archaeological work, the archaeological discoveries that were happening at this time. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the Sarnath, uh, uh, the Buddha uh, preaching his first sermon at Sarnath. Uh, and uh, there's the Pratitya Samutpad Sutra which is found at the, at the bottom of um, Bose's uh, painting. Uh, and this uh, 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 was found, this um, uh, inscribed slab was found actually by Alexander Cunningham in uh, his work in 1833 at Sarna. So the point that I'm making is that this, uh, what Bose draws on was not available in some history book where he went, looked at the book and then sort of made his uh, speculative uh, drawings. But that he was very sensitive, um, very aware of the archaeological material and was using that archaeological material to make a point. Um, uh, and this leads me to, the, to my second question, which is that how did the choice, who decided? There are only 22 paintings. And there's a lot of history, India, you know, from prehistory to the modern. So why, who made this choice? Who decided, uh, you know, what is going to be included and what is going to be left out? Was it Bose himself? Uh, I mean, did he decide that this is how it's going to happen? Was it a political party? Uh, was it the Constituent Assembly who said that uh, uh, you know this is what should be done? Uh, the Constituent Assembly, in fact, was a remarkable body of 28, four, 24, sorry, 24 men and women who did not agree with each other. And it's quite remarkable that at the end they came up with a document which they all agreed on. Uh, so, the, so we don't have any evidence of either Bose being um, given instructions uh, or the fact that the Constituent Assembly told him what he should do. Um, I have looked at uh, I've looked at the debates. I've looked at the um, the um, the print media, the newspaper cuttings, um, and I've looked at um, the paintings themselves. Uh, what comes out very clearly is. Um, that there was a whole involvement of what one, what one would call public history, national imagination, if you would like to call it, in the 19th and 20th century. And that um, this, uh, there are a whole lot of reasons why this was happening, which I can't go into, uh, but the point that I argue, and this I argue in my, in my own book, Return of the Buddha, is uh, that there was a lot that was happening, a lot of debate, discussion, dialogue, um, and there's nothing which I have found, maybe, you know, that may come out later, uh, which uh, really shows us who gave instructions for things to be included. What we have in the National Archives is a letter uh, which was written um, uh, from the President to the Prime Minister. And uh, it talks about that both should be asked to undertake this work. Um, and what I thought quite interesting was that, uh, you know, they don't even pay him a, um, a decent sum. And they say, oh, well, OK, he's only asked for uh, money for materials. Uh, and that's where it stands. Um, so um, clearly then, um, you know, there was, uh, there was something far greater than just this, the nation state deciding or independent India, the politicians of independent India deciding what should go, what should be painted. And Bose, of course, is very well known um, for his um, idea, um, which Tagore starts with, art for the community. And for the fact that at many sessions of the Congress, he did, um, he did establish um, sort of exhibitions. Uh, he worked with local artists. And that um, the use of uh, paintings, particularly uh, in Bose's association, both with Tagore and with Gandhi, 
for um, for a public message is something which is very important. Uh, so certainly, I would argue that unlike um, a lot of uh, what one reads in secondary literature uh, about the study of the uh, of heritage or of the ancient past being dictated by the colonial state or by the nationalists, I would argue it is public imagination. And the reason why I say this is uh, on several grounds. The first excavation, archaeological excavation of a Buddhist tomb was in 1830, long before the archaeological survey of India was set up. Archaeological survey of India was set up in 1861. So before the state set up, the colonial state set up institutions for an understanding or study of the past, the first excavation had been done. It was done by the French, and it was done in the uh, in Punjab uh, under Maharaja Ranjit Singh. So a private raja, a private ruler, uh, had nothing to do with the East India Company, uh, had very little to do with um, uh, with uh, the state. Um, the, uh, the interesting part is that he was not looking for Buddhism, he was not looking for scoops either, he was looking for the remains of Alexander's horse. And uh, so he ex there, was the, there was the local narratives of the side of Manikya which, uh, which related or which uh, talked about the site being the burial spot of Alexander's horse. Uh, so there is a whole new dimension which needs to be brought in. How did people explain, you know, people who live around there, how did they look at all these, uh, these ruins and monuments and how did they explain these ruins and monuments to themselves? So clearly, this is again, 1830 is again another story because that comes from the Persian, the Shahnameh and uh, you know, the way, the Persian uh, tradition which I don't want to, I don't have time. 1879, again, public history, popular uh, memory, Edwin Arnold wrote his Light of Asia. This was uh, trashed by all historians and all academics. And they said, you know, he didn't get his sources right. He didn't understand the sources. The point remains that this book was translated into several languages and had a major impact on thinking in India. Uh, 1891, the Mahabodhi Society was founded in Colombo. The Mahabodhi Society took it upon itself to, uh, to find sites associated with the Buddha, and, uh, um, um, including Bodh Gaya and so on. And 1893, um, I think the last speaker who was here, um, uh, Sager, Professor Sager, talked about World Parliament of Religions. Uh, and if you look at uh, the number of people who went, uh, the Buddhists were the second largest contingent after Christianity, which I think is quite surprising in 1893. So in the 19th century, there was lots that was happening in terms of public participation, in terms of debate, dialogue, discussion, um, and in terms of institutions, which had very little to do with the state or with um, the East India Company or the British Raj. Um, what I also found very interesting is the media coverage, the print media, for example, extensively in the 19th and early 20th century talks about archaeological excavations, uh, about work that is being done, uh, and about the re enshrinement of relics. Now, let me tell you what that means. Uh, the stoops or the Buddhist stoops were built on um, relics um, of the Buddha or of his disciples. When archaeological excavations took place, many of these relics were found, so bone, ash, uh, other things were found. What was to be done with this? Um, where were they to be kept? Now, in, the, uh, in, uh, in 1851, when Alexander Cunningham found the relics at Sanchi, uh, the relic containers were sent to the British Museum, but the relics were just destroyed because nobody recognized them as relics. It was only ash and it was only bones. And Alexander Cunningham had no use for this. He was looking for gems, he was looking for sculptures, and he was looking for coins, not, you know, some pieces of bone and ash. Uh, but gradually this changed. But the, the point that I'm trying to make is that uh, in the 19th century, many of these relics were re-enshrined, either in stoops, um, uh, either in uh, in new constructions, for example, Sarnath, the Mool Gandha Kuti was a new construction. 
near the Sarnath Stoop. But what these relics did was uh, they were reported at great length because these relics were taken in processions. Uh, a lot of people became aware of these relics being re -trined. So there was a lot of public, uh, public uh, involvement and, uh, uh, and sort of really participation in this uh, 19th, century, um, 19th century discovery of Buddhism. One example, and I can go on and on on the uh, media, the print media, and the way in which the print media played around and produced its own sense of history. This is from New York Times, 1910. And uh, it shows a uh, recitation of the text that Varanasi, except that they were not Buddhist texts, but anyway, you know, media is media. So <laughs> you can juxtapose and create a fascinating history. Uh, and similarly, you have the Dalai Lama, whom they call uh, the man of mystery, divine, uh, uh, revealed by the camera. And of course, there are a whole lot of other juxtapositions which create this sense of wonder or of uh, the unknown um, as far as Buddhism is concerned. So uh, the point that I've made so far is certainly uh, the first point that certainly when we look at the 19th century and what was happening, uh, there was um, a public involvement, uh, public imagination, uh, which finally took the shape of um, uh, increasing reportage of archaeology and the inclusion of um, uh, archaeological um, discoveries in uh, paintings by books. Let me move on to um, the archaeology of Nalanda. What I'm not going to do is tell you how it happened. I'm sure you all of you know that. Um, what I'm going to do is to point out where we can move forward. There's no point in just going giving a chronological order. So the first point is that already by the early 19th century, uh, Francis Buchanan uh, has um, he found a large number of uh, sculptures um, which have been reported and to some extent catalogued. Um, what has been completely neglected is uh, Buchanan's uh, detailed account of the oral traditions relating to the ruins. So he gives an account of you know how did people think of this, what was happening, um, what, how did people explain to themselves that in you know near their villages there were these ruins. Uh, so what were these ruins uh, all about? Uh, and that I, have said, uh, that I think is something which needs to be followed up. The second point that I think is very important is broadly. Uh, he was a collector of the district um, uh, of uh, Bihar Sharif and he collected a large number of sculptures. So we do know that 686 sculptures uh, that broadly collected are today in the Indian Museum. Kolkata. They were shifted from the Bihar Museum to the Indian Museum, Kolkata. Um, what uh, is missing, and these sculptures are really gigantic, colossal, and um, stupendous. So this is the colossal uh, Varaha image, which was found by Broadly. It is today in um, the Indian Museum, Kolkata. The labels of Indian Museum, Kolkata do not mention Nalanda at all. They mentioned Bihar, which could be anywhere. Um, Friedrich Asher has done very extensive archival work where he has identified Nalanda as the place of origin of a lot of sculptures in Indian Museum Kolkata, which are today, their provenance is given as Bihar, not Nalanda. The second point um, is where do these sculptures, uh, you know, what is the precise location? Where do they come from? How do we put it back in the landscape? Do we only look at them as sculptures, you know, which were collected and lost, or do we put it in the landscape? So that is something which I think uh, we need to take that forward. Um, another thing which is of great interest is that um, broadly he provided a list of sculptures which were enshrined in modern temples. What does this mean? They were not worshipped as a Buddha for sure. They were worshipped as whatever else. What does this mean? Why, um, you know, we all know Buddhism declined, nobody paid much attention. So what is this re enshrinement all about? How do we explain that? How do we work on that? Um, and also what is interesting I found is this seal which everybody talks about and one hears about, that this is the Nalanda seal, and this is the seal of Nalanda Mahavihar. 
Now you find the seal of this, this symbol of two deer and the Dharma Chakra on a whole range of other objects, on sculptures, on copper plates, um, uh, on seals themselves. Um, and I think only when we um, really do a rigorous analysis are we in a position to move beyond just um, the cursory and saying that uh, you know this is what all about. Now, Nalanda today is completely Chinese. Sorry, Max, but this I think is um, is largely um, Alexander Cunningham and his um, his obsession with Shansa. Uh, what is interesting and what nobody talks about is Nalanda in Tibetan imagination post 12th century. Uh, not just Nalanda, the Tibetan uh, corpus uh, provides uh, an imaginary Buddhist landscape all over North India, stretching from Punjab, uh, Bodhgaya, Nalanda, Sravasti, and so on, which is related to the way in which post 12th century Tibet uh, monks, travelers, imagine the Buddhist, um, uh, the Buddhist history. And this has, uh, and again, this has to do with also various uh, uh, who traveled, the Dharmaswami, and um, uh, Bhadra and many people who traveled and wrote about. So there's a completely different world which emerges from uh, the Tibetan tradition um, and which brings not just uh, texts but also uh, uh, the pilgrims to Nalanda every year. Um, so if there is this continuity, uh, what do we make of Nalanda as a modern reconstruction? As Andre has made it. Um, if it is indeed a modern reconstruction and really is a 20th century reconstruction, what do we do with all of this that I've just talked about? The continuity, the transformation, the sources, um, and the way in which Nalanda interacted with a very large uh, corpus of, um, or is reflected in a large corpus of material. Um, the second point is uh, something which I hinted earlier, it's a social base of monastic Buddhism. Uh, was Buddhism only about monks and nuns and uh, royal patronage? If we look at the literature on Nalanda today, that's what one is uh, led to believe. But there's been a lot of work, particularly two people I would like to uh, highlight. Uh, Buddha Vardhanes' work, 1979, uh, Robert the Plough. Uh, which talks about monastic control of uh, reservoirs, tanks in medieval Sri Lanka and the way in which uh, the monasteries, the Sangha, uh, worked very closely uh, with patrons, that means uh, rich landlords, agricultural production, uh, and also the, uh, the peasants and the farmers uh, who were part of this larger, um, uh, larger network. The other work, which is also very interesting, is Julia Shaw's work at Sanchi, uh, where she's done survey work, where she's looked at involvement of the Sangha with water reservoirs, and particularly food, uh, food uh, changes in food, uh, wet rice cultivation. Wet rice cultivation requires a lot more water, uh, can support larger uh, communities, larger villages, uh, provides greater surplus. So how does, uh, how does control of this water, how does control or change in, uh, in food uh, production, uh, what bearing does this have on the landscape? Uh, so clearly then, uh, if we spatially map, uh, not just the distribution of monastic sites, but also the way in which it changes, uh, we, get, uh, we get a very complex and uh, mosaic which we need uh, to, uh, to really uh, 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 resurrect and put back in uh, our understanding of Kalanda. <coughs> Just an example of the kind of work that has been done in Sri Lanka. Uh, where Sri Lankan chronicles, um, uh, 4th, 5th century chronicles, refer to large scale construction of irrigation works. And the Sangha is a major, uh, a major party to this. Um, the invention of, of uh, water technology, um, the, um, the Samantha Pasadika refers to sluices. And um, so that makes Gunavardhani argue that. Um, 
um, sorry for the misspelling, um, donations of large agricultural tracts uh, worked to uh, the mutual advantage of not just the sangha and the farmers, but also the donors. And this, in fact, has been um, one of the sites that um, uh, does provide us data for this is Anuradhapura, which is also a World Heritage Site. Uh, let me move on quickly with Nalanda's uh, wider linkages with other sites um, in, uh, in the subcontinent, and I'm not going beyond the subcontinent, um, and that draws in with national and transnational. Uh, we do know of monks from Pahadpur, which is now in Bangladesh, uh, making donations at Nalanda. Uh, we also know of uh, Maharaja Balaputra Dev of Suvarna Dweepa or uh, Sumatra making donations. So clearly uh, there, are, uh, there are networks which extend uh, beyond, uh, beyond the immediate environments of Nalanda. The other point I would like to bring in is the presence of Hindu deities, supposed Hindu uh, deities at Buddhist sites. And this has to do with the whole way in which you understand religion in a pre-modern period and so on. Uh, I'd just like to leave you with these examples. Uh, Hindu deities are a common practice, not just in medieval Buddhism, starting as early as Gandhar, Mathura, Kushan, <coughs> and you find several um, uh, at Nalanda, at uh, Baharpur, um, you find several representations. Um, A.J. Gail, uh, the Buddhologist, he has argued that um, uh, these Buddhist, uh, these Hindu deities, sorry, form the outer circle of the Buddhist mandalas, and hence you have these Hindu deities. But um, I would say that this is, uh, so in a, in a situation like this, this is Temple uh, 2 at Nalanda. There are 220 sculpted panels. We survive, and uh, certainly a lot of them are Hindu deities. So certainly, in the case of this, it works. But it doesn't work when you have individual deities. And if you go to the museum, you can see Vishnu, Shiva, Parvati, um, and this is not just Nalanda, this is Sarnath, Shivaling, and I could just go on and on, Bahadur and you know. So how do we explain this? What does this mean? How do we understand the interaction? How do we understand the categorization? And I think the way in which we define categories, in which we define what is Buddhism or Hinduism, you know, all these isms, I think um, that's critical to the way in which uh, we understand the relationship between uh, different between communities or in allegiance to different religions, um, and uh, the way in which we understand how the cultural landscape worked. Uh, what do we do with uh, Balaputra Deva of uh, Subarna Deva, Sumatra, um, and the Shailendra kings uh, from uh, Sumatra, who made all these uh, inscriptions? And certainly, you have not just at Nalanda. There's one at the other end of the subcontinent, at Nagapattinam, on the Tamil coast. Uh, so Nalanda is one in the middle of in eastern India, but there's another one way down south. Uh, and what is interesting is that when you read the inscription, um, Balaputra Deva is making donations to the monastery, but um, he also refers to uh, several Hindu deities. He also refers to the to the epics and to the Mahabharat. And uh, we do know, not just from Nalanda's, from the inscription at Nalanda, but the, the late copper plate inscription of the Cholas, uh, that Shailendras um, and kings from Sumatra donated in a big way to Buddhist monasteries. Now the slight problem uh, with the monastery at Nagapattinam is that it doesn't exist. Uh, Nalanda exists, so we know the uh, monastery, we know when we go there, you know, people tell us, oh, this is where the inscription was found. But Nagapattinam on the Tamil coast is no longer, uh, it doesn't exist. Uh, that arrow shows you what it looked like in the 18th century uh, in um, a watercolor. Uh, this, um, this was on the coast and it was known as the Chinese pagoda because um, the person who drew it uh, thought that that's what it closely resembled. Uh, that's to tell you where Nagapattinam is, the arrow on, uh, on the slide uh, on the left uh, shows you where Nagapattinam is, and the slide on the right shows you that it's not an isolated site, that it's a site uh, which uh, is very close to a whole lot of other Buddhist coastal sites, and also is very close to the Brihadeshwar temple at Thantrabur, which is a major uh, Hindu temple. 
nevertheless, this is what um, an earlier drawing uh, suggests, what uh, the Chinese pagoda at Nanapatinam looked like, but this was destroyed in, uh, uh, in the 19th century. Uh, and uh, if you go today to Nagapatinam, this is what you get. You don't get the Chinese pagoda, uh, you don't get uh, any other structures, but you get this 19th century building, which is today the district court. Um, it was, uh, the pagoda was demolished to build uh, a Jesuit college, which is today uh, not at Nagapatinam, but further inland, so that's what you get today. But what is interesting and what I would like to come back to is that when this, uh, when this was destroyed, when the pagoda was destroyed, what they got were large numbers of Buddhist bronzes and bronze images, uh, uh, 350 of them. And these images, these Buddhist bronzes are very different from the ones at Nalanda. Nalanda, if you read on Buddhist bronzes, people argue that this was kept in the shrines of individual monks. Uh, Nagapatinam, uh, it is the destruction of the temple uh, which shows that the Buddhist bronzes were interred under a temple. The bronzes themselves are very different. Uh, I really don't have time to go into this, but uh, the, uh, both the stone sculptures uh, and the bronzes, I'm just going to move on to that. Um, uh, these are large Buddhist stone sculptures. So if you actually compare to contemporary sites, which were in touch, largely through donations made by the Sumatran and the Shalendran rulers. Uh, the material culture of both those Buddhist sites is very different. They are not the same. Uh, they, in terms of stone sculpture and bronzes, are very different. So which brings me back to uh, what then, uh, what was the uniqueness of Nalanda and vis-a-vis uh, 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 -vis, uh, Nagapatina. Nalanda certainly is marked by an enormous range and richness of stone sculptures as compared to Nagapatinam, so we still need to explain why. Um, we uh, also know of a large number of votives, stone scoops at Nalanda, which doesn't exist at Nagapatinam, or maybe it did, we don't have it. Uh, there is an absence of stone stucco images at Nagapatinam. Um, and certainly, what is very interesting at Nagapatinam are these huge images which were taken out in ritual processions, which we don't get at Nalanda. So there are, there are several variations, and I would argue this on and on for sites in Orissa, sites in, um, uh, you know, elsewhere in Eastern India, and sites uh, further north. But I will just shift very briefly and very close uh, to the fact that a lot of manuscripts were written at Nalanda. And uh, this is again something which, uh, which we have not brought into the discourse. Uh, which uh, we have not taken into account as we uh, as we sort of work our, on our understanding of Nalanda, uh, and um, this is uh, one of the one of the famous uh, uh, manuscripts um, which has a codophone, uh, which was written in Nalanda and which provides us uh, with information uh, on uh, this very uh, very dynamic culture of scribes. Uh, writing and rewriting manuscripts at Nalanda. So finally then, what is the challenge? Uh, the challenge is that what I have tried to show um, is a multi-layered history of Nalanda. It does not stop in the ancient period, it does not stop in the 12th century, uh, but it continues and finds its way into our constitution. So it has continued pretty much into the present. Uh, so here is a very rich, a very complex mosaic. The problem is that our legislation is only unidimensional. It only looks at monuments, it only looks at them in either nature and culture uh, distinction. So we have a real challenge, and this challenge is uh, how to uh, translate this multi-layered history um, into uh, a World Heritage nomination which reflects, uh, the, uh, which reflects the understanding, the research done by academics, scholars, um, uh, and so on, um, and also produces a document which uh, puts Nalanda on a global level. You know, not just, okay, there's a, you know, it'll promote tourism in uh, a regional context. I think that's sort of demeaning uh, the, uh, the, very, um, the very university itself. So I think that, uh, that to my mind, is 
uh, really a challenge. Um, the challenge is both in terms of um, the plurality, but also the interconnectedness. So we need to not just look at the Buddhist side of the excavated remains of Nalanda, but um, Nalanda in its uh, local complexity, in its regional interconnectedness, and the way in which it links up with other sites in the subcontinent. And there is a lot of archaeological material that is available uh, for this. Um, and um, the, um, the cultural plurality, I think, is important. Um, and I think that is something um, that we seldom talk about uh, because um, we have uh, divided monuments into all these things as we have gone along. Um, so uh, my plea and my, uh, my uh, sort of humble request for all of you would be um, that if we really want to put Nalanda back um, to what we perceive it, uh, then all these various aspects need to be put into, need to be brought on the table, and need to be put into the discussion. Otherwise, uh, I think we are just demeaning uh, the whole name of Nalanda itself. Thank you very much. Could we switch on? Fascinating, I would say. And I think I was completely wrong by stating this, what I now would call the um, Ray Triangle. Oh, so sorry. From archaeology <laughs> to reception history and to preservation of heritage. Um, but I don't want to misuse my, my position here and just would like to open the floor. Uh, is it normal I have to ask uh, um, the members of staff 